Marion Naidu, and um, I've worked um, alongside and supporting people um, living with dementia and also the people who provide their care for many, many years, in fact, most of my working life. Um, in that time, I've been able to engage with carers and people living with dementia very much around what their lived experience has been and how that might influence um, how we improve services that are provided, but also how that can influence policy. And it's something I'm really, really passionate about, but I do think we've got a long way to go before we can really capture um, the experience that is out there and, um, and, and to find ways that we can really, really use that in how we provide support for people. Um, one of the things that are really is really, really important and comes up quite a lot in my conversations with carers and with people living with dementia is food and good nutrition. And I just wanted to think a little moment about what we mean by good nutrition, because people say quite often that they are overwhelmed when they try and um, look for information about what kind of food they should be eating, what kind of food you can offer people when they're struggling to eat or they don't have much appetite. And I think the idea of, um, of good nutrition, although that's what we want, and really we all know what we need to be eating to stay well, but sometimes it can be really difficult for people who um, who just don't fancy some things. And I think particularly at the moment when there's so much pressure on budgets and finance, that we have to think about what do we mean by good enough nutrition? And to try and take care of the person that we're supporting by providing um, interesting and nutritious food, but also with ourselves. Over the past five years, I've been working with a cancer charity and um, Although that may seem to be a very different set of challenges than living with dementia, I was struck by the similarities in terms of food and um, people who are having some challenging treatment and the kind of things that it has and impacts on how people feel as far as appetites concerned, nausea, swallowing difficulties. And I was very lucky to work alongside some amazing nutritional therapists and learned a lot um, about how to, to really focus on the food that you're providing, how to make it interesting, how to cope with these challenges that we may come across on a day-to-day -day basis. And also how to do this um, within a limited budget. And those things I think are crucial uh, for people at home supporting somebody who's living with dementia and really, really doing the best that they can and not really focusing on the pressure. I, I don't think we understand enough about the pressure that people are on to produce food for people who are sometimes very challenged in what they can eat, what they want to eat. So hopefully this blog will help us to look at some of those things in a bit more detail. But also I wanted to encourage you, um, people who are caring for people with dementia, people living with dementia, to send in your ideas to the website as well, because you are finding solutions on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's where the expertise is. And if we can come together as an online community and share and help with these ideas, then I think we take ourselves much more further along this understanding nutrition and understanding food and the complexities of trying to provide wonderful food for people with living with dementia. Um, thing that's really really important I think in focusing on um, on food is the timing timing of meals can become really really important for people and also um, changes in the timing of when we want to eat um, whereas you know you may want your main, main meal at lunchtime at the moment that might change depending on your um, energy levels during the day, what you've been doing, but also really importantly, I think how well you're sleeping and how that sleeping pattern may also change. So somebody who had 
um, a main meal in the evening, may now want their main meal at lunchtime and feel hungrier at lunchtime. So it's very important to try and listen to the person you're providing food for and listen very carefully to how those patterns of timing may already have changed. Some people are absolutely ravenous in the morning and, and really want a hearty breakfast. Again, if that's what somebody wants, that's fine. And yet later on in the day, the appetite can diminish. Um, but for some people, it may be completely the opposite. So no appetite in the morning, maybe a big lunch and only a snack in the evening. The important thing to remember is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just go with the flow and listen to um, the person and what they're asking for and see if that is a change and go with the change. Sometimes people prefer to move away from um, th this notion that we have of you have to have three meals a day, breakfast, lunch and dinner. And they, for whatever reason, it, it may be um, lack of concentration. It may be that they don't want to sit and eat um, and find that difficult to sit down for long periods of time. It may be that swallowing difficulties are also affecting how long it takes somebody to eat. So the burden of a big meal becomes too difficult for an individual. So in that situation and in those situations, try and just offer small amounts very often. So maybe, you know, every couple of hours. Um, so you could have um, maybe a yogurt first thing in the morning or a piece of toast and then mid morning, something that again, that has some nutritional content if possible, swap it around. So if you had toast, have a yogurt or just a boiled egg. Um, and again, at lunchtime, a very, very small portion. Um, and don't worry about, you know, having meat and two veg. It really doesn't matter so long as you mix it up a bit and have a little bit of, of, of each of the kind of different food groups. So you might have a fish finger that's sliced into little pieces, very, very small sandwiches with a couple of berries and maybe some nuts and a small slice of cake whatever it is just try and look at the whole day and and really really mix and match so that you are trying to get a balance a good balance but it doesn't matter if it's every hour every two hours again just listen to the person that you're with look at how much they're eating if they can't clear their plate give them smaller and offer it more frequently <music> It's, it's quite common um, just in, in general aging that our taste preferences change. And, um, and it's the same for people living with dementia. You may suddenly um, having requests for more salty food or something that's sour. And there is, it's, it's whatever is happening inside our mouths and our taste buds as they become duller with age or just sometimes, I can remember talking to somebody and they said, I'm, I'm looking for that taste of childhood. And they were talking particularly about a lamb chop and lamb chops didn't taste the same. So she was never satisfied with the food that was in front of her. And again, that was due to um, changing in, in how that individual was experiencing taste. And I guess the, the important thing is just don't worry about it. If somebody wants more salty things, um, you know, so long as it's not in excess and you make sure that somebody is with a, with a higher salt intake is having plenty of fluids, um, just go with the flow. I mean, it really is, it's, it's having something to eat is much preferable to having nothing to eat. And I think if we remember that and not get too anxious and not too um, worried about the, the, the content, it's, it's fine. So long as, as they are eating and drinking in, um, and having a bit of variety, it's fine. Even if you sit down and you really don't, the person that you've provided your food for 
doesn't eat a main course, you can, and they want to just have the pudding, have the pudding, as long as they enjoy it. And um, yeah, it's, it's the pleasure is just as important as the nutritional comfort and that you're not causing your, your, the person you're caring for any undue distress. It can be really important as well to um, to check if your um, the person that you're providing food for is often refusing food. It can be quite important to check in their mouth because quite often, particularly with um, as our mouth um, changes shape, particularly if we've got dentures, that sometimes dentures can become loose and rub, and you you end up with um, with a sore gum. Um, and but just sometimes you know you you can inadvertently bite your cheek you can have a sore tongue all of these things are really really important to check and if you notice that um, that the person you're providing food for is seems to be in pain or seems to be um, in distress check um, check their mouths make sure that they are drinking plenty um, and also check for um, check if they have a sore throat. So have, have a good look, and if you see anything, then get some treatment for that because um, it can be very very painful if you if you do have something painful in your mouth, um, and can create some distress around meal times, um, which may not be easy for that person to explain what's going on. So just check for that because it is quite common. Sometimes um, it's really important to make sure that the food that you're offering is um, is soft and is moist because it's much easier to um, if if you are um, trying to eat something that's really really dry. It's much easier if um, if it is moist and that you can chew it and swallow it without um, without any difficulty. I mean, even if, you know, sometimes you can have a piece of chicken and it's really, really dry. If you are beginning to have swallowing difficulties that can exacerbate that. So really look at the food and say, is it soft enough? Is it moist enough? And if it isn't, then, then just change it up a bit because that really, really does help people to eat comfortably. When you're sitting down with someone um, to eat, give some gentle reminders um, through the meal because quite often, and you know, we all do it, but but people with um, living with dementia um, can be easily distracted, um, and something catches their attention. Looking out the window, listening to a sound, fiddling with something, and just again remind. Um, a person that they're, they're having some food um, and even as much as to um, as, as our brains change with dementia the sequencing sometimes doesn't work properly so it's a, you have to remind people sometimes to pick up the knife and fork to cut their food to put it in their mouth to chew but just be very very observant and if you see that someone has lost attention just give them that gentle prompt that they're having lunch, what they're having for lunch, and to pick it up and to continue with that before there's too much of a gap. Otherwise, the meal time can go on for a very long time and they really will get frustrated with that. So yes, gentle reminders can be really, really helpful um, through the meal. What happens um, sometimes when when we get bored with the food that we're eating and you're sitting down with someone for lunch and it can quite often become a chore and a challenge one thing that very often works is to um, to introduce some reminiscence to talk about um, school meals 
What did you eat at school? What were school meals like? What was your favourite? Did you hate them? Did you love them? Um, and really try and understand the kind of food that has perhaps happy memories, pleasurable days out, things that, that someone will connect with as an enjoyable experience. Um, so it's really important to spend time in, in just, because we assume we know everything about each other um, and we don't. So try and find out as much as you can about that person, about how they grew up, um, where they accessed food, um, things that they really, really hated as a child, um, and even as a teenager, how their food tastes changed. And it's a real opportunity for a very, very social um, occasion, rather than something that's, that's kind of goal orientated, that you have to eat this amount of food, but make it almost like a, a short um, reminiscence session, if you can. Um, and even some special occasion food like what, you know, if you're married, what did you eat at your wedding? Can you remember that? What was the best wedding that you went to? What's the best party that you went to? What was special about the food? And just introducing some of those things um, that will prompt some comfort and some um, happy memories if they're memories that can be accessed. can um, also create changes in our visual field um, and of course this is something that will really really affect um, meal times and food and how we present the food can really support somebody who's experiencing these changes um, so for example if you have vanilla ice cream in a white bowl it might be difficult to see so um, and rice pudding in a white bowl um, so just be mindful that you can um, you can deal with that by having some colorful crockery so a red bowl uh, for white ice cream and white rice pudding and there is um, evidence that people prefer red, that there's some that it's, it's easier to see, but it's also preferable to other colours. Um, you can also avoid really having plates and crockery with patterns on because quite often you can confuse the pattern on the, on the plate. It might be a flower, it might be a berry, whatever that pattern is. Um, gets mixed up with the food on the plate. Um, and I think it's, it's also uh, worth trying having a, what we call a colourful plate. So food of different colours. So you might have some green beans and some yellow sweet corn. Um, but just think about if, if you know, that you, you're not presenting somebody with a, with a beige range of food on a, on a beige plate. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind is the, the sort of the visual field. So if you're leaving snacks for somebody while you're, you're leaving them on their own or you're going out, make sure that they're directly in their field of vision, because if they're on the side, on a side table, they may not see them. They may not know that they're there and so won't, um, won't have access to those. So all of these things are, are really, really important. Um, and the other thing I think that the people have often said is that um, they have a favourite cup. Um, my mum would only drink out of a china cup and when she was in hospital she wouldn't drink out of, it's certainly not a sippy cup, but she had to. So we brought her cup in, her special cup, and it changed instantly. Um, she recognised her cup, she got pleasure from her tea in her cup and it was something that that really did work for her. Drinking enough is something that, um, that people struggle with and um, certainly many carers I've talked to worry about the, um, the person they're caring for not having enough to drink and becoming dehydrated and that may be creating um, other challenges. Uh, so if you're finding um, that the person you're caring for is 
drinking less, not drinking enough. There are several things that you can try. Um, the first is their cup preference. Um, and as I said before, some people really, really have a preference for a particular kind of cup, um, or they don't like a mug, or they don't like um, particularly sippy cups. And although it can be um, a little more challenging sometimes, try and find the cup that, or the glass that that person really does prefer because it will encourage them to drink if it's going to be possible. Um, some people will want a, a very colorful mug or a cup and will recognize that that is something that contains something that they want to drink. And other people may prefer a see-through cup um, so that they can actually see what it is that's in the cup. Just putting a drink in front of somebody um, again, it's it's quite often necessary to say uh, you need to drink, um, but just having the cup there that with the changes in the brain, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to pick it up and drink. So make sure that you reinforce that this is a drink, so pick it up and have a drink. Um, and if you're really finding it difficult, then think about uh, offering foods that are have a high um, hydration level, so a lot of fluid in the food. So for example, jelly. Jelly has a very high um, water content. Um, if, if you don't want to give jelly custard, um, sorbets, that sort of thing, or even looking at soups again, um, instead of, of, of a, a solid lunch, you can have soup and again that that's really rehydrating you and casseroles, casseroles that have a lot of sauce or or gravy. So just think of, of um, not necessarily focusing on the drinking, but how you can um, make sure that there's high fluid content in the food that you're offering as well. And that will really help to keep somebody hydrated. We also need to think about um, the environment that um, we're in when we're providing food for somebody living with dementia, because um, as I've already talked about, if somebody's easily distracted and you're in a room where there's a lot, it's very busy, there's a lot going on, then they're going to be easily distracted there and not focus um, on the food that they're going to eat or that you want them to eat. Um, so it's really important if, if the person um, you're with is easily distracted to make sure that you're in a quiet, relaxed atmosphere. The other thing, again, is to think about the visual disturbances and if you've got very low light um, then it's going to be difficult for somebody to see so make sure that the room is lit well that they're sitting in a comfortable chair and that they have a a, a solid base to to eat from as well um, there was some work uh, I was involved in a few years ago for uh, people who were in hospital with dementia and food was brought to them and they trialed for a period of time getting people out of bed, those that could get out of bed and sitting at the table and those people ate much better in a much more um, happy way than, than having food in bed. So again think about the person that you know and that you're providing food for about how they feel about sitting in a chair for instance um, you know beside the television um, would they are they someone who always sat at the table um, and again you know working with people who they've you know they want the table set they want it to that's what they did and that's what they continue to do because it's familiar so really really try to um, to think about those things as well and and really focus on the environment and what's around people what's happening outside whether the, the television is a distraction whether there's a radio that's a distraction and I think also it's it's really important to think about um, sometimes mealtimes can be anxious 
um, particularly if you're very concerned that that um, they're not eating enough and you're worried about that. But it's really important to try and and not to allow stress and the anxiety that you have to be brought into the meal and that, and that's really really hard when you're you're tired and you're stressed and you're anxious but if somebody picks up on that that will create um, anxiety and stress for them perhaps and make meal time um, much more stressful than than it has to be but i think in the end we need to just do the best that we can. Meal times can be challenging. They can be fraught with um, with anxiety. They can be a constant worry about um, just getting enough good nutrition into the person that you're providing food for. But in the end, you need to focus on yourself as well, and you need to make sure that you're eating well in a relaxed way, that you're having a, a balanced diet. And I think also thinking about it um, working within a budget uh, can be very challenging for people as well. So always remember some food, any food is better than no food and relax and try and just acknowledge that you're doing your best and your best is good enough.